Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I'd just like to, to give you a, sort of a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about today. And I want to keep it uh, as informal uh, as possible, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, scholarship opportunities um, in the, uh, the Army and the Navy, um, and also the Uniformed Services University, um, which is a medical school um, that is uh, uh, a military medical school um, in Bethesda. Um, Maryland. And so, so these are some of the things we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on military medicine. I'm going to uh, run through some of my slides. You'll have access to the slide deck. I will not cover all of them in it because there's a lot of slides. But it's sort of an overview of, of, of some of the things that you can do uh, practicing uh, uh, medicine in the military. Um, did you guys have any opening comments? Okay, um, so uh, in, in terms of the Army, um, and, and I'm going to uh, um, just mention this, in terms of the scholarship, um, the Health Profession Scholarship Program um, is, is the largest scholarship program uh, for medical school in the nation. Um, and actually the Army's program in and of itself is the largest program in the nation, and then when you add in the, uh, the Air Force and the Navy, um, you've got uh, obviously by far and away the largest program in, in the, uh, the nation. Dr. Wynn, do you know how many scholarships? We have 246 scholarships. Okay. So 246, the Army, the Army gives out uh, 275. And then, of course, there's also the Air Force, which is probably about 240 um, per year. Um, and those are all full, full four-year scholarships. Um, so full ride, they paid for any accredited medical school in the nation. Um, so you get accepted to uh, whatever medical school uh, in the country accredited, um, and the military will pay for it. Um, they will pay all of your expenses. All your books, your fees, your tuition, anything associated with that medical school, the military pays for. It doesn't matter if it's the most expensive in the, in the nation or the least expensive. It doesn't matter if you're in-state, out-of-state, none of that matters, whatever it costs you to go. Um, and then also you'll get a, stip a monthly stipend of just under $2,200 a month to live off of. Um, and that's the, uh, the, the essentially the program for the Army and what, uh, for the military. And what you owe for the scholarship is a year for a year. So if they pay for four years of medical school, you'll owe four years as a military physician. Um, uh, and so that's the, the essential deal with the scholarship. You want to just address the uniform services? Sure. Um, so like I said, John DeGus, um, I'm actually a uh, third year resident at Family Medicine uh, Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. Um, and I attended the Uniform Services University uh, and it was prior service. Uh, that's not the most common route to go there, but uh, it definitely it didn't hurt my chances of getting in. But uh, they are uh, the military medical school. So if you uh, are thinking about going into military medicine or you have a strong opinion that you definitely want to do military medicine, that's what they teach you to do. They, you know, they teach you all the different things that you're going to need to know about, uh, about medicine to be a good physician, period. But then they also teach you how that applies to the military. So that's the one benefit to, for me to going to that school, or at least as far as what my job entails. Um, but that all aside, it's a medical school that is basically tuition free. I got paid to go to medical school. I was an active duty uh, ensign in the United States Navy, so an uh, 01. And uh, if you have prior service time, that basically that will add in to your, to your pay while you're there. So that, uh, that kind of ups the ante a little bit. Um, and then you basically get a, your you know, monthly paychecks, your normal monthly active duty paychecks, your housing allowance on top of that. So uh, it's a four year program. Um, there, uh, there is a way to do MD, PhD as well with it if you wanted to. Um, if you do the four year, or uh, if you uh, attend this school, it's basically a seven year commitment after residency because they put a little bit more time and energy into training you. Um, unlike with the scholarship, they just paid somebody else to do it and they didn't have to have the facility for it. So with my school, basically they expect a little bit more commitment from you afterwards. So after you're done with your training, you owe seven years. They have Army, Air Force, Navy, and Public Health Service slots as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, um, once again, if anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to, to interrupt. I'm just going to go through just some of my experiences uh, just in the military. Um, I've uh, uh, actually been um, on active duty in the Army for a little over 24 years now. Um, and uh, for me, did you go to, were you issues or uh, HPSP? HPSP. HPSP. Um, so uh, so uh, Dr. Wynn and myself both um, went to uh, medical school, uh, civilian medical school, and were on scholarship. Um, and so did it a uh, little bit different than the, the um, uh, military medical school. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
typically I recommend that you apply for the scholarship um, at the same time you would apply to medical school. And so really, if you were thinking about the Uniformed Services University, you check that box, and if you're thinking about the scholarship, you fill out the application for the scholarship. Um, and then you, you know, let it decide where you, wanna, where you wanna go, what works best for you. That's usually the best time to do it. That way you get the paperwork in. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what happens is is that um, uh, yes, essentially you do. But what what's going to happen is is that you're going to get your applications in, and then once you've gotten your acceptance letter, they put that on your packet, and then they send it to the to the board. The board meets every month, um, and so uh, you will uh, essentially once you sent your packet in, you've already got it complete. You're just waiting for your acceptance letter. Um, send that in. Goes to the next board. But then maybe it's a little bit different. Um, you can we give acceptances for scholarships even without an acceptance letter. But the point is that apply for the scholarship at the same time that you apply for medical school. If you get the scholarship, I remember one of the things when I was applying, I was trying to decide between HPSB versus USUS. Uh, the HPSB guys kept telling me about, uh, you know, if you get the scholarship with us, you know, you get that accepted a little bit earlier before you actually get an acceptance letter to med school, you can send them that letter saying like, hey, you don't have to worry about how this guy's going to pay for it. Um, so that's maybe one extra card in, in, in your stack. So. Another thing is that um, for any type of military uh, training, uses or the HPSD, you have to have that security background check and also a physical examination part as well as the academic part. So in reality, all three uses and then the HPSP, Army, Navy, or Air Force, we all use this have the, have the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you can use that to apply for all, all of them or all whatever branches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. As well as for uses. Yeah. So just if you're thinking about you want to go military, whether it be uses or HPSP, it, you can, it's a still the same process. Okay. So it keeps keeps your options open. So um, uh, so in terms of in terms of, of the army, and I'm a, I'm going to assume that the other branches are very similar. So it, the majority are through the scholarship program, um, and then about somewhere between 10 to 15 percent go through um, the Uniformed Services University. Obviously, because it's one one medical school. Um, so uh, and this is the 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 program once again very similar uh, between the different branches. Um, and this, like I said, this is in the slide deck. Um, it just gives you a rough idea of, of many medical schools throughout the nation um, have students that are on scholarship. Um, and I just want to show you the, uh, my officer basic class uh, back in, uh, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. So in terms of those kind of things, uh, he's going to address what they do in, uh, in the Uniformed Services University during medical school uh, on the scholarship. Uh, your only real contact with the military um, is going to be uh, when you'll go to your, do your officer basic. Um, and what that is, is, is it's essentially an orientation to the military. Um, it is not boot camp. Um, it's nothing like boot camp. Um, uh, but for those people that you know, want to do it, they can do other things. But really what it is, is just an orientation. How to wear the uniform, where patches go, um, just to get a, a basic idea. Because most people uh, don't have any uh, previous contact with the military and to get an idea of what you're supposed to do. So it's a six week uh, course. For the Army, it's in San Antonio. Uh, that's about four weeks of death by PowerPoint and then two weeks of, of some field training still in the city of San Antonio. Uh, but it's like uh, learning uh, medical triage, this kind of stuff. And that will be your, your contact with the military. And then in your third and fourth years, um, for uh, actually for for all of us, um, what happens is, is that you'll get to do uh, some rotations um, at military hospitals. And really what you're, what you're doing that for is one, to get experience, but two, to do your interviews. Um, so the military will pay for you to go do uh, a rotation at one of the military hospitals. You can meet the staff that you want to work with and the specialty you want to work with and interview with them. Um, so it really gives you, gives you the opportunity to see if that's especially in the location and the people that you want to work with. If you want to address what, what you guys do during your shoot. Yeah, so uh, at Ushis, the first two years, uh, like I said, you're active duty. So I went to school every day in my uniform and I, I did my... Uh, all of my, you know, basic sciences for medical school in, uh, in, uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. And then the second two years, and they're actually starting to advance this a little bit, so sometime about halfway through the second year, you're going to start doing your clinical clerkships. Um, and those are primarily done at military installations. So at, uh, Walter Reed uh, National Medical Center, which is the big joint facility there in Bethesda, uh, that's, that's, the biggest, uh, that's the biggest location for those. Uh, but then there's ones all over the country. I went to, uh, actually I went to Travis Air Force Base for my family medicine rotation. I went to Triple Army Hospital out in Hawaii for my internal medicine rotation. 
I went down to Portsmouth, Virginia. I went to San Antonio, Texas. So I went all over the place to different military uh, installations, including uh, some civilian programs as well. I did uh, uh, I did a surgical ICU rotation at Washington Hospital Center in uh, uh, in Washington D.C. There, so. Um, you're going to go do all, uh, all of the same stuff pretty much regardless, but you do your officer training um, right before you start school, that basic officer course. If you haven't already been an officer, then uh, you do that officer basic course right beforehand. Uh, there was a question there? Oh, yeah. So did you choose to bounce around to those places, or did they send you? Uh, it's, it's somewhat done on a lottery system because there's only so many slots. There's 170 people in each class, so there's only so many slots in each different rotation. So they have to kind of spread the wealth around the country a little bit. Uh, so it's it's done on a lottery system. They try to make it as fair as possible. So then you basically look at the list. When your number comes up, you pick what you want. Okay, and I have another question. How many military medical schools are there? One. Just one. Just one. So, so one of the differences, is, at least uh, for my training, is, is that um, I, I went to the University of Cincinnati for medical school. So I did all my training there. Um, it, I mean, I stayed right in this little complex area, uh, other than my military rotations, um, which, once again, just differences. Some people uh, uh, like to move around. There are some medical schools right. that actually do uh, more of that, uh, where they rotate at different hospitals throughout the country. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. You said that you did um, your training at uh, Cincinnati, mm -hmm. um, and your clinical rotations were different. So is that your third and fourth year you did that? So my, my medical school, all four years were at the University of Cincinnati. Um, but then, but then you get um, uh, one rotation or one um, uh, uh, block of time where the military will pay for it during your third and fourth year, um, where you will go to a, a military hospital and do a rotation: pediatrics, internal medicine, OB/GYN, dermatology, whatever you're interested in, and do a rotation at at one of the military hospitals. And like I said, that's the opportunity for you to interview, to show them what you got. Um, uh, and, and just to, to get to experience some of the military medicine firsthand. He, he would be getting the experience that he gets to, he does the military medicine uh, or every day. He's in working in those facilities. Right. Um, for us, it wasn't, wasn't that way. Right. And the other thing is, um, you know, I, I did bounce around a lot. That was mostly during my third year. I went, uh, I think, one time out of D.C. during my fourth year, and that was by choice, to go interview at the program that I wanted to uh, attend, which was in Camp Pendleton. Um, but... Uh, that a lot of people will either, you know, can spend the entire like two years outside of the D.C. area and go to different facilities, or you can, you know, there's a pretty good chance you can stay your entire two, two years of clinical clerkships there. So it's, you know, there's a, a pretty good mix of, you know, each group of people that want to do or, you know, want to go wh whichever way. And so it usually ends up working out. You're able to achieve most of what you want. So. Go ahead. Uh, no, I just want to cover a couple other things. So this is really, and, and uh, these slides were dedicated for the Army, but it's really all the branches. Um, it, it, these are some of the things that I, I thought of and a lot of us think about who've been practicing. And the reason why we still wear the uniform is these are a lot of the advantages to continuing to practice in the military. Um, just in this last year, we look at this every year in the, in the, uh, in the Army, um, is as we look at, at retention. Um, so we look at people who've paid back their scholarship. Okay, so you pay that four years back for your scholarship. What are the chances um, that you're going to stay in the military? Uh, and and when, you, when you think about it, you're still young. Okay? Now you don't have any debts. You can go into private practice. What are the chances you're going to stay in the military? And in 2011, 70% of our physicians stayed in the military. Okay? That tells me one of two things. One, they either really like the way, what they get to practice and how they get to practice in the military. Two, they don't like the way it's looking on the outside or three really, the combination of the both. Uh, but when you get exposed to it, you'll, you'll find, wow, this is kind of nice. This is uh, you know, an opportunity that I hadn't thought of. But these are some of the things that, that I will run, I'm gonna run through very quickly. Um, so in terms of, of, of um, uh, the, your training, your residencies and your fellowships, those kind of things, the Army does them all um, uh, internally, all at our facilities. So uh, you'll see here that uh, in this last year, there were, we had 1,329 docs that were in training uh, they were in-house facilities, and there was only about a, a, a hundred that were outside. Most of those were very uh, specialized um, uh, fellowships. The Navy, I don't believe, is quite as high, and I know the Air Force isn't as high in terms of training um, in uh, military uh, residencies and fellowships. Um, I think they train. I don't know what their numbers are for I the. I don't, I don't know, know the yeah. specifics. I know it's the majority of the people in the Navy do stay in a military facility. It's you know it's usually somebody that is either you know wants to specialize in something that's very like highly specific 
that maybe the Navy doesn't, uh, you know, offer that training right. for, or enough of the slots for. So. And one of the questions that we get is, well, you know, do I have to train? You know, you know, how can I know that the, the training is good? Two of the parameters that I like to look at is, is one is board pass rate. So when you sit down for your specialty boards, whether it's OBGYN, surgery, uh, family medicine, for the first time, what is the chances that you're going to pass your boards? Last year for, for, the, uh, for the Army, it was 96% first time board pass rate. The national average is between 75 and 80%. Okay, so, and that's going to be true of the Navy and the Air Force. Um, they, we make sure our, our physicians can pass their boards. Um, which we track it, we make sure that our docs are able to pass their, their specialty boards so they can practice in their specialty. The other thing is, is when they look at accreditation, um, which is basically, it's a, it's a group that looks at, at, if you're doing the training that you're supposed to be doing for your, tr your specialty, and when you look at it, um, you can get a maximum of five years accreditation. Um, the Army average this last year was uh, 4.31 years versus a civilian average of less than four years, okay? Um, so the military does very well. Their programs are highly ranked nationally. Some of the programs are some of the finest in the, in the nation. I think of some of our emergency medicine um, and surgical programs are some of the finest in the nations. Uh, civilians, you know, it's not Hopkins, it's not Stanford. Um, you know, it's some of these Army uh, and, uh, and military programs. I keep referring back to the Army. Uh, it's, a, it's a force of habit, but one of the things you're going to find is, is that many of these programs are merged. Um, the, the Army and the Navy are merged in the capital area. In San Antonio, the Air Force and the Army are merged. In Portsmouth, Virginia, it's the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, uh, and we, we all work together, um, uh, and that's what we find. Uh, and that's why one of, the, one of my assignments was actually at Balboa in San Diego for three years. I worked uh, for the Navy for three years. Um, uh, we already talked about that, and these will be on the slides. I just want to throw out advanced training. So you get to do the training that you want to do after your residency. If you want to do a fellowship, you can do it. You can get that training if you want to do it. If you want to go get advanced degrees, the MPH, Master in Hospital Administration, whatever you want, you can go get that training. And one of the nice things about military medicine, and one of the reasons why I've stayed in, is, is because you can change your pathway. Um, you can do clinical or, or, or surgical, whatever, you're into that, and then maybe it gets a little bit tiring day to day. Well, I want to do more teaching. She can go off and do teaching. I want to do more research. Maybe I want to do more administrative or, or operational and go out with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the soldiers and sailors and airmen for a year. You can do that too. Um, and then you can come back to where you want. Um, so we don't get bored. Um, it's very, very nice. Uh, um, I don't know about your experiences. Well, to tag on top of that, I've met a number of physicians that have also, you know, a couple years into their career realized that, you know, maybe the, the track that I picked, you know, I went into internal medicine. I, I'd rather be a surgeon, or I went into emergency medicine, I want to do primary care, Wh whatever. You, know, you actually have the opportunity to switch, go back to another residency, and not have a big, you know, life, uh, you know, you know, crashed in order to do that. You, you don't have to forfeit a whole, you know, huge paycheck because you're still on active duty, you're still getting paid. So, so it's, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice benefit that, you know, allows you a little more flexibility. Uh, um, I'll use my own career as an example. Um, I went to the Naval Academy, so I started my military career during college. Then I got a scholarship to go to Stanford. Um, I did my internship at Bethesda. I was a flight surgeon in Japan for two years. I traveled all throughout Asia. I did medical mission trips on my own to Vietnam. Then I got a scholarship to do my residency at, in dermatology at UPenn. So I finished my residency about two years ago, and since then I've taken on this job in which I talk to students about the, the scholarship opportunities, and I, and I run the board in which um, we, I review the applications. But in doing this job, I've also learned about other opportunities, avenues that I can pursue other than dermatology. For example, um, international health or pre um, preventive medicine, disaster relief. And that's something that's available to me even though I've finished my dermatology residency. So it, th the military, think of it like um, as a drawing board in which you know, different times in your life, in your career, you want to pursue different things. The military is, is very flexible about that and gives you that opportunity. It sends you to schools, Hopkins or Harvard, to pursue these degrees because we need that, especially in international health, um, disaster relief. So it, for me, it's, it's, uh, it, I couldn't have imagined a better career because now I get to travel around the United States talking to students like you to share my experiences. But then, you know, in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to do international medicine. And now I have that opportunity to pursue that fellowship, you know, in a year or two and then travel courtesy of the Navy to all, all over the world, to Asia, to Europe, wherever, wherever I want. We have, we actually, p students ask, do I have input into where I'm going to go? Is the Navy going to send me wherever? No, you don't. You actually do have input. The military is very good about working with you 
to help you attain your goals. And, and, and in terms of, of your input, that is very important for the military. Contrary to what you often see with, with you know, the young soldiers and sailors and airmen, you know, where they get their orders and they're, they're off packing, it doesn't work that way with us. Um, basically, there's uh, fewer slots where we potentially can go. And what, what happens is, is that they, it's usually a, a specialty advisor in whatever specialty you are. They say, here, here this is where the openings are going to be this year. Which ones are you interested in? Um, and then you work that out together. Um, and you can negotiate it. Now obviously if you, if you, you know, wanted to go to a location and there's no openings, well then obviously that one's not available at that time. Um, but they really want to, to do what they can to keep you um, happy with your job. Um, uh, and, I, and I find that's one thing that the military has done which surprised me. And I didn't, I didn't expect that when I, uh, when I joined up. Um, I just, I'll show you a couple things here. Um, you guys know that the costs are going way up for medical school. Um, including the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the funding that, that uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the loans uh, for medical school. But, but in terms of match data, you know, there is going to be, there is more and more students in the civilian sector that are not matching. Um, and this is because of this, this bolus of, of students that are coming through um, and there's not a, a, uh, uh, an equivalent number of residency slots. In the military, we control the number of students that we have coming through and the number of residency slots. Um, and it's very nice because it always falls out very nicely in terms of what people want for specialties and people match. And so we actually have a better uh, match rate for our, for our docs. The exception would be is if you've got somebody who's got unrealistic goals. And that's really the, the big exception that I find. So if you want to be a neurosurgeon um, and then you're in the bottom third of your medical school class and you think that you're still going to be a neurosurgeon, honestly, they will talk to you. One of the docs say, listen, probably not going to match, okay? If you still pursue it, you know, that's where, where, where um, you probably won't match and then they've got to find something for you. Now, the military will not force you into a specialty that you don't want, okay? You'll go into the specialty that you want, but if you want to be a neurosurgeon and it's not available, then you're going to have to pick something else, just like you would have to do in the civilian sector, okay? Dermatology is a very competitive uh, uh, field, um, and so there are people that don't match in dermatology. Um, and so, you know, they, you've got to, they'll let you know whether you're going to be competitive or not. Um, so I just I use these slides for my uh, thing. So in, in terms of the military, uh, the, these, I just want to give you an overview in terms of the Army. Army tends to be located more in the, where our hospitals are, in the southeastern, uh, the southeast and the, the uh, east coast. Um, of course, the Navy's got the, the uh, couple of major uh, locations in Southern California um, where you can work. And those are the locations after you finish your residency. Um, for the Army, the, we have four main places where we do our residencies at, and that is in San Antonio, Texas, uh, in Tacoma, Washington, in uh, the National Capital Area in D.C., and then in Honolulu, Hawaii. And then the Navy has got... The Navy has Portsmouth, Virginia, the D.C. area, mm -hmm. which is combined with Army, and San Diego, California. And then if you do family medicine, it's completely separate from those three big ones. It's Camp Pendleton, which is near, San or near Balboa, and uh, Bremerton, Washington, uh, Pensacola, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Okay, and I just throw this in there just to show you that the overview of the residencies, okay, and the same is going to be true for, for all the branches of the services, okay, They're, all the residencies are there. Uh, the only one that I know that the Army doesn't train is, is the combined programs like med, internal medicine, pediatrics, which just happened to be what I did. Um, they don't do those combined programs, but all other specialties um, are available, and this is residencies, not, not, um, not fellowships. Um, um, uh, and this just shows you the number of uh, where the locations are at. And I, once again, I've got this in the slide deck. Um, and this is the Army Hospital in Hawaii. Um, uh, and this is the one in San Antonio. And I put these up there just so you can see. Uh, when you go to these facilities, they're impressive. They're very impressive hospitals. And I've had uh, people who were unsure about what they wanted to go into, and they went and saw one of our facilities and said, okay, yeah, you know, that's the nicest hospital I've ever seen. Um, and uh, some of the facilities are just absolutely beautiful. Um, so we've already covered this. Um, uh, research, um, if you're interested in research, okay, the military is big on research. Uh, uh, currently ongoing, I think of a couple things. Uh, uh, they say that 40% of all the vaccines that are in use today had some part of their research and development you know, in the military. Um, currently, the, I know the Army has got two um, phase three trials, so that's the human study trials. Uh, one for an HIV vaccine, it's the only group that has an HIV vaccine in a phase three trial, the Army Research Lab in Thailand. And then we also have a, a, a breast cancer vaccine um, in, uh, uh, that's being studied phase three trial in San Antonio. So if you're interested in research, um, big time research. Um, 
and that's the whole research command. Um, in terms of, of um, some of the things that we get to do, uh, she, uh, Dr. Wen already had mentioned some of these things. A lot of humanitarian missions. Uh, the Army participates in, in 120 to 150, and I know the Navy's got to be uh, very similar in terms of the number of uh, humanitarian missions that they participate in. In fact, the Navy still has two ships, right? Comfort and Mercy? Comfort. They have two, two ships dedicated, uh, uh, not dedicated they, they participate in a lot of the humanitarian missions and, and um, disaster relief throughout the world. Um, so I just participated in on Pacific Partnership, uh, and that was, uh, we visited four countries in Asia, um, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So and that was a, over a three month time period. So if you're interested in humanitarian work, this is something you can do, and I think I've got a couple pictures here. Uh, so I was, I've, I've participated in humanitarian work in the Philippines, um, in Honduras, and in, in Korea. Um, uh, these, for in the Army, uh, they're almost all voluntary completely voluntary because they've got more than enough people, more than enough docs that want to do it. Um, and for me, I, I think it's a life-changing sort of uh, opportunity if you ever get a chance to participate in one of these humanitarian missions. Uh, or disaster relief, you know, they'll let you know that, that you know, they're going out and if you're interested in going out. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, essentially what happens is, is in the Army, we're, uh, it, it depends on what part of the world you're actually stationed in. So like in San Antonio, we go into uh, Central America. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, we would go out to Asia. Um, and so that's the way it works for us. For the Navy, um, it's a little bit like that because with Operation Balakatans, we had Navy docks there too. Uh, but then if you're out on, on your, your the ships, it's going to be dedicated. <coughs> you know where you're going to be. So you can volunteer for those. Um, it, it alternates its coast. So for, for example, uh, it just happened on the West Coast. So in two years, it'll happen again on the West Coast. Um, so next year, it'll be on the East Coast and they'll visit South America. But those are all voluntary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They basically just solicit for people every time it comes up and you mm -hmm. say, yeah, I want to do that or no. And even as a college student, you can also volunteer too, yeah, through NGOs, through uh, um, non-government organizations, like for example, UCSD uh, pre-dental organization. A lot of college students go under their umbrella. If you go to their website, you can access that and, and let them know you're interested. So, so over and above, you know, the scholarship and the opportunity to pay for medical school, um, you know, I've talked, we, we've talked a lot about some of the opportunities, some of the things that, that I think about why it's a, it's a good choice. The one thing that I haven't mentioned uh, for me and what a big, big reason why I've stayed in is because of family. Um, I, I didn't expect that, um, that the opportunities and the experiences that I would get to have with my family would be the way that they are, uh, but it's one of the reasons why I stayed in the military. Um, because uh, many primary care physicians, um, family medicine or, or, or internal medicine or pediatrics, these people are working some seriously long hours and very, very, very busy schedules. Uh, and it's not that we don't work long hours and have busy schedules, uh, but, but the military is very pro-family. And so um, things like this weekend, um, you know, Columbus Day is a federal holiday. Um, you know, that is like any sort of uh, 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 traditional holiday, um, and our facilities um, are not in normal operation status. So that is a day you spend with, get to spend with your family. Uh, all military physicians, like all military members, um, get 30 days of paid vacation every single year. If you don't use it, you'll roll it into the next year. And so you've got plenty of time to spend with your family. Um, and uh, to me, I, you know, you can't really put a price on that um, in being able to enjoy your life and, in, and enjoy um, what you've earned. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why I have stayed in. Um, other than when um, you know, I was uh, uh, deployed, uh, I have never missed any of my kids' school events. Now, and the reason why in primary care, um, and I, probably it's true in, in dermatology too, when something comes up at the school or something comes up with your family, you work together as a team. And so I can get somebody to cover for me, um, and I can go to my kid's school event, and I'll cover for them. Um, and we work that way in our system. Um, and it's very collegial. Um, you know, you know I, the Navy asked me uh, if I would come work at the Naval Hospital for three years in San Diego. Sure, I'd love to. I you know, love the experience. Um, I ever actually went out and did a couple of Tiger cruises with the Navy uh, just to have the experience. It's get, get a ride out on a, on a ship to Hawaii. It was pretty hard. Um, uh, but you can have those opportunities. And, 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 and these guys work in the National Capital area are working with Army and Air Force docs every single day. Um, and, and that's the same thing that, that, that I get. Our, our fellowship is actually, uh, we have all branches of the service there too. Um, so we all work together um, and uh, in many regards are interchangeable. Um, 
Yeah, I, you know, attending the uh, attending UCIS, having all three services there, and then a couple of extra people with the public health service, you you really get start to develop a good like a collegial attitude with the with the other services. You get to find out a little bit more about what it's going to be like to work amongst and with each other at, uh, on different uh, you know on deployments or in the hospitals that you know. So he he worked at a. Uh, at a naval institution, I, I've seen Navy docs work at Army hospitals, at Air Force hospitals. So it's um, you know it's a very good opportunity to do those things and have it basically helps broaden the experience a little bit. As far as you know, the support of family goes. Uh, you know, everyone has family crises that come up, and the Navy and the Army understand that, and um, you know they they support you through that. I mean, I've had a number of issues throughout while I was in med school and in residency that I've had. You know, to need get some support from my uh, from my colleagues and from my institution, and uh, they were always uh, more than willing to help. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it it makes it feel much more like home. And it, I mean, I, I I'd never want uh, you know I'd never want to do anything to uh, to go away from that. I mean, there's just no reason why I'd want to. I mean, there, I get every benefit that I need from the Navy, and uh, they're going to continue to pay me as long as I'm willing to stay. So. Um, so, you know, I just have to be willing to travel every so often. So. I think uh. it's, it's a win-win it's a situation. Um, I, you know, I talk to students about this all the time. I, if, I think if more students knew about all the pauses that came from it, we would be inundated with applications. I mean, it allows you to practice medicine the way you want. You don't deny, we, I don't deny patients care. I can give them any medicine that I want, and I can take as much time as I want with them. And that's what medicine is about. If you're on the outside, you're going to be pushed for time, pushed to see five, six patients an hour. You, deny, you, you will deny patients care because they don't have insurance, and then you'll be limited in what medicine you give them. So one, it allows me to be the doctor I've always wanted. Two, as a female, I can have a family and I have enough time for my family and my kids. Three, I get to wear my uniform. I get to take care of the men and women that are risking their lives to save our country, to, to, to defend our rights. Um, and three, the most important thing is leadership. You guys, were, you guys are all called to be leaders. You guys are all smart and hardworking. And in the military, the military puts you outside of your comfort zone and pushes you in a leadership position so that you stand out there and you're pushed to your limit and you're called, you, you then practice your leadership skills. And that's what's going to make you become leaders in our country. You're put in that position. You become like those you surround yourself with, right? So uh, people like in the military are sacrificial, are unselfish people that want to give back to our country. And so if you surround yourself with people like that, that's what you are going to become. Even if you decide to get out afterwards, you compared to your civilian counterparts, you guys are going to be head and shoulders above your civilian counterparts in terms of your leadership capabilities and your ability to interact with other people. Um, and I, I can tell you this from my own personal experience. I came from a very sheltered Asian family, first generation, and I absolutely did not even think about the military. And I only joined the Naval Academy, I, I applied to the Naval Academy because my sister told me to because she, she also wanted to go to the Academy. And if because of that route, my life is completely different from my civilian counterparts. I've traveled around the world. I've flown in helicopters. Um, I've landed on the, uh, an aircraft carrier. Um, I've done mission trips to Vietnam. I've, I've interacted with top leaders in my own field because of the Navy. I'm the Navy's young physician rep to the American Medical Association, and I interact with top leaders in dermatology. And so I am surrounded by leaders in this country, not only in the military, but in the civilian sector. And so it pushes me and allows me to contribute back to our country. And think about it, in medicine, you impact patient by patient, right? But in the military, it allows you to impact people on a global level. So it push it, 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 it then takes you to another level in which you have, you're so much more appreciative of the opportunities that this military has given us and our country has given us. So that's why I'm encouraging you to join the Navy. And I think, I think about um, the opportunities um, for leadership and for, and for doing things that you didn't expect. And, and, and I can echo uh, Dr. Wynn's comments. I mean, I remember going back for a high school reunion in 20 years and meeting with old, old friends and they would tell me, yeah, I'm running this trucking business. I've been doing it for 20 years. And, and they would keep coming back to me, now, where have you been? What have you done? And I had, I, wow, I guess I really have gotten a chance to experience yeah. things. And one thing, I, there's, a, there's a book out there, um, the, uh, it's White House doctor, White House doctor, White House physician. Um, anybody think about who the White House physicians are? They're military doctors. Okay? They're military doctors. And, and there's a, a book, uh, I can't remember her name. Um, she uh, was a Navy doc who was the White House physician during the, the primarily the Clinton 
administration um, and talks about all watching and being the physician there in the White House at all of the big political events and, and, and sort of the inside scoop from as a physician. And these are these kind of unique opportunities that if that's what you want to do, go for it. You want to be the Surgeon General, go for it. The Army's got their first uh, woman Surgeon General. Um, you know, I mean, if that's what you want to do, um, you can strive for those things um, and be a leader and have experiences that you're not going to get anywhere else um, in, in medicine and really make changes um, to healthcare. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And the other thing is the brotherhood that we have. Yeah. I mean, we're in the uniform, we just inherently trust each other. And we're like a big family. Um, and you don't get that anywhere else. I mean, as no a graduate way. of the Naval Academy, anyone else that graduates from there, it's like an instant bond. And you're not gonna get that in the civilian sector, so. You know, I, I, and as, just to add on top of everything that they were saying, you know, I'm, um, I'm a, the poster child of opportunity from the military. I, so <laughs> I, I uh, you know, I graduated from high school. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do. My last thing in the world I was thinking about was joining the military. Uh, I had a bunch of, you know, random teenager things happen to me that seemed like the end of the world. and and uh, of course they weren't and uh, finally you know the words that my dad kept telling me you should think about joining the military finally kind of rang true because I wasn't sure how I was going to go to college so went to uh, join the Coast Guard initially did nine years active duty in the Coast Guard did tuition assistance uh, got my undergraduate degree done with that uh, well with the half first half of it and then um, and then I finished my uh, I, I finished my bachelor's degree with uh, uh, the GI Bill and then I applied to UCIS and I got my medical school paid for. And now I've been in the military for 15 years straight and I have uh, you know, a seven year commitment after this, this coming academic year. And I'm probably gonna stay in for much, much longer than that. Um, you know, never wanted to join the military when I was a kid, but I'm probably never gonna leave, I love it. Um, you know, I've had so much benefit and so much opportunity from it. And, you know, I, and I also think about the career path that I've chosen, specifically family medicine, uh, you can, <laughs> the idea of family medicine is really to be able to take care of somebody from conception to death. Um, and you're very restricted if you're not in the military in, in your ability to do that. You end up being a little bit more specialized in one area or the, or the other. You don't do OB care maybe. You don't do geriatrics. In the military you're expected to do all of that. There is no uh, malpractice insurance that I have to uh, be concerned with paying, uh, paying so I don't have to worry about paying for OB malpractice insurance, I can deliver babies and not have to uh, worry about that stuff. Um, you know, I still do deliver the same standard of care, I just don't have to think about how I'm gonna pay for that insurance. So, you know, the benefits that, that the military offers me is, I think of as un un limitless possibilities. Uh, I'm not, you know, you, you can be very restricted in civilian medicine, military basically wipes a lot of those boundaries away. And, and go ahead, please. Uh, those who do go into the civilian sector after they've paid back their years, do you see them struggle with the transition at all, or is that a pretty? Uh, my, my experience has been um, they have, uh, they will get cards and letters and people trying to recruit them yeah. all over the place. Everybody wants them. Um, You're a leader. Uh, because they've got so, mu so much more experience with, yeah. the, with the leadership and, and uh, there's just a maturity that, that comes with that. But, but the other thing that I, I, I find is, is that they, in terms of the transition, when they go in, out there, they realize, wow, um, I really liked what I was doing. Um, and many of them want to come back in. Um, and, and so that's the, the, the difficulty in transition. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, they miss some of the things is really the, the transition. Um, I, just one last thing I want to make comment is because I'm at the, uh, the tail end of my, my uh, career. I've been in active duty for 24 years. I could have retired four years ago and didn't. Um, uh, and I'm staying, staying in and the reason why I stay in other than all the things that we, we've, we've uh, uh, talked about is, is, is that one of the reasons why you can stay in this long is, is that now I've got a retirement. The day I get out, I've got a retirement coming in. So that gives me the opportunities to do with medicine what I want to because I don't have to worry about getting paid. Okay? I can go do what I want to do is humanitarian work. I want to go do humanitarian work and I don't have to worry about how am I going to pay for things because I've already got a paycheck. So I can work part time, do humanitarian, you can do whatever you want. You've got so many opportunities after you've served 20 years. Yeah, I can retire at the age of 44 from the military if I wanted to, and then you know not have to worry about that uh, as much about the paycheck. So, people, okay. just to, to answer that question, I my own boss actually went out to do um, to work for Harvard for two years and then came back in. Um, partly, be one of the reasons was because he didn't like the way medicine was practiced on the outside, and then two, he missed the camaraderie of the military. So, yes. Sure. 
of your residency count towards you paying it back, or is it after you complete residency? Um, I, the easiest way to describe it, I call it neutral. Um, uh, essentially, you're, you're any anytime you're in training, um, you're not paying back your obligation. It gets a little bit. Um, but, but bottom, just think of that as being a neutral time. That's the easiest way to, to, to describe it. Yeah, so there's some of the operational billets and stuff that and the Navy has a lot more of these things that are kind of in, in between or in the middle of your residency. Um, we can you know, explain more about that if you guys like, but uh, those, uh, those are considered payment uh, times because you're not in training. You're providing you know, care to the troops and not being trained at the time. So, I think they need us to wrap up. Is there any last questions? Sir? Are you uh, active duty after you graduate med school on the HPSP? You yes. Guys, so on yes. graduation, you yep. are then active. Yep, right? yep. that's when you start getting paid as active duty. Sir. The number of scholarships offered by the various services, is that in addition to the class at USU? Yes. 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 So how many is in the, each class? It's roughly 170 each year. And so the Army has 275 scholarships, the Navy has 246. 46, and I would guess the Air Force is right around with, with the Navy. Right, and I think it's, um, it roughly breaks down to about like 50 Air Force, 50 Navy, and 60, um, um, 60 Army, plus a couple of public health service, and then sometimes they have a few extra. A few uniform services. Okay, and just to confirm, so I could apply for both at the same time, mm -hmm. like for my, like, Civilian Medical School Scholarship and... Well, and Ucius. Yeah. Yes. And is, it's just another medical school on the national application. You do not have to be in the military to apply there. Uh, you apply through, I, I think it's called AMCAS, and I, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just one of the schools on the list. You click that, you get accepted, you have to join the service.